The MHPM would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the unceded lands, seas and waterways across Australia upon which our webinar presenters and participants are located. We wish to pay respect to Elders past and present, and we acknowledge the sovereignty of all First Nations people. Hi, I'm Damien Wicks, and welcome to the 900 plus people who have registered for this webinar and the people who are watching us live today. Today's webinar focuses on a new initiative, which is a unique partnership between Black Rainbow and the Mental Health Professionals Network. And this is the first in a series of four webinars, and we'll talk about the second one at the end of today, um, produced in this partnership, and it explores how practitioners can better support the mental health and social and emotional wellbeing needs of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander LGBTIQA plus SB community. Today's webinar in particular focuses on the impact of COVID-19 on the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community and how to strengthen the wellbeing and mental health literacy of services and increase the access to these. Next slide, please. So I'm your facilitator. I'm Professor Damien Riggs. I'm at Flinders University and I'm also a psychotherapist who works in private practice. And today's speaker is the founder of Black Rainbow, Damien Bonson. Damien, could you tell us a little bit about Queer Robbery and how it came about, please? Yeah, hi. Um, hello, everybody. Um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and the lands that we all are meeting. And um, I'm coming from Larrakia country up here in the Northern Territory. Um, Queer Robbery came about um, as the creative way of coming up with <clears throat> um, giving information in regards to uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, queer folk and the work that we are doing. Um, it's kind of been, become creative in terms of that, you know, in a post-COVID world or post-lockdown world, the embracing of um, using video conferencing. And it was a really, really unique way for us to um, to reach um, those that can't attend conferences or or even the um, when we don't get opportunities as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander queer folk to present at conferences, this is a way of greater reach. And the, the number of registrations, I think, is re really is testament to how effective um, this vehicle is. Thanks, Damien. Next slide, please. So as we've already mentioned, the aims of this webinar are to discuss the impact of COVID-19 on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander LGBTIQA and sister girls and brother boy community and how to strengthen the mental health and social and emotional wellbeing, literacy of services and to increase access. You've got our learning outcomes here and I think they're gonna be really well covered in the material that Damien's gonna to present to you now. And then we're gonna have quite an extensive time for questions, some of which you have all kindly sent into us already. And um, we've had a great time looking at those together and also those that come in live during the session. Next slide, please. And I'll hand it over to Damien to start talking through this project that he conducted and the outcomes that he has found. Yes, uh, the, um, the report for us was an opportunity. Uh, for those aren't familiar with Black Rainbow, we, are a, we operate on donations. We're an unwaged volunteer organisation that I founded. And so the opportunity um, for us, we saw COVID as, sorry, as an opportunity to collect some data. Um, there is no data in terms of um, First Nations LGBTQI plus um, people. Um, I began speaking publicly about that in around 2016. So this was an opportunity to draw on our donations and, and, and engage with them, you know, one of our community partners, at, which is Macquarie University, to, to get some baseline data. Um, there's a sense of pride for us um, at Black Rainbow for, for producing this report um, and that this study has been, you know, led by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander rainbow folk, um, and it's been written by us as well. Um, there, it also, in the process we've had to go through to achieve this, which is to use donations to be unwaged volunteers, it speaks to the structural barriers that exist um, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, queer folk when it comes to preventing suicide within our mob. Um, thank you all so much for registering and attending today. Um, we're really glad that there is an interest here in um, what, what we have to say and what the results um, tell us. Next slide, please. Um, you will receive an access to the report um, just um, several, in a couple of days. Um, we just had some technical issues on my end um, to make sure that it was all ready. Um, 
So the slides that you'll see today are snapshots from the report, uh, and they draw on the information from the report that is more pertinent to the mental health workforce and also um, those that are attending today. Within the re report, there will be a lot more information, um, but this, what I'll talk about today or speak to, is more specific to the mental health um, profession. Now, all three of these uh, infographics are of particular concern. Um, because we have no baseline um, data um, to make a comparison, we, we are comfortable to assume that these are elevated experiences, given that you know we've all experienced um, COVID and COVID lockdown um, at a, a national level, but even at a global level and the impact that that's had. Um, nonetheless, these are alarming um, that half um, up to close to half of the participants experience, experience suicidal thoughts um, is particularly distressing. Um, it is worrisome because there hasn't been a substantive investment in um, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, you know, um, LGBTQI plus sister girl brother boy suicide prevention. And therefore, we actually don't know what it should look like in terms of intervention or prevention <clears throat> for for our community. So though, that that half this um, of the respondents indicated, you know. Um, having these suicidal thoughts really should alarm people or pique their interest to to mobilise, to, to at least champion um, that that work needs to be done. Similarly, with the high numbers um, of the negative uh, impacts on mental health, we don't know what mental health interventions look like for our community during these moments of distress, uh, let alone if these, these moments uh, prolong and go on for, you know, plus or three months and turn into a diagnosis, what then does the support look like? Uh, next slide, please. It is heartening that in the light of um, what the previous slide has told us, that a significant number did access support from within their family and friends network, that they were actively um, aware of who the, I guess, the lack of better word, the stress that they were in. Um, they were mindful of that and very conscious of that, and they had someone to go to. It is also a, a strength, and I think that speaks to... Uh, to the, I guess, the the close-knitness of um, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community, especially at a family level. Next slide, please. Um, that the connections were strengthened um, for a large part of the respondents um, is also really positive. Um, and we just hope that there is longevity in that, that it's not just in, in the light of, um, you know, a, a catastrophe or crisis um, that is COVID. Um, but at the same time, with the quarter saying that they felt less connected, um, this is also worrisome. Um, we don't have any baseline data to even know how connected they were initially. Um, but it, that you know, just over a quarter um, expressed that they felt less less connected um, is a cause of concern in terms of well, what supports are going to be out there for those people who are feeling isolated. When I first started Black Rainbow um, on my iPhone 4, this is back in 2013, it was with the premise that an Aboriginal child stranger, LGBTQI plus sister girl or brother boy person could get online and see themselves reflected positively. And I created those two accounts on Twitter and on Facebook because there was nothing in suicide prevention for our community. Um, and to say that, you know, six years later is the first time we're going to have any baseline data, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done, um, and particularly the speed in which it needs to be done. Next slide. Something, Damien, that I would really like to sort of comment on and maybe ask you to comment on is, you know, some of our viewers today may wonder about the sample size that you've got, but I'd really like to remind people that, you know, Indigenous people are a bit over 3% of the population, and of those maybe 4%, maybe more, are queer. Um, so I think it's it, we need to keep those figures in mind when we think about the size of this sample. I think the size of the sample is probably likely quite representative. Um, is there anything that you would like to say about that? Look, absolutely. We were really pleased that with the numbers that we got um, for this survey, it was the first of its kind at a national level as well. And so to have these large numbers, it, it's, the data is really rich. Um, I was saving this to the end of the presentation that 
for those that are watching and see opportunities of how we can implement some of these um, these findings um, or, in, or assist with implementation science of some of these findings. Um, I'm not across everything and how to do everything. And, and you know, Black Rainbow, we're always um, seeking support from outside of our networks or even to with new networks. But there is quite a bit of data in here that can one mobilize um, intervention efforts and prevention efforts, but also around research. And we'd love to continue to partner with new organizations and institutions to continue doing this research. Um, we almost, this is number nine, is it? Yep. Yeah. So I think the, um, the connections were really strengthened. Um, so we're strengthened is really positive. Um, again, are we on nine or 10? Sorry. We're, no, on right. the, we're on the correct slide that you should be. Oh, okay. On. Yeah. No, I sorry. I was just felt I was, realized I was repeating myself. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the use of this particular slide here is the use of um, social media, um, which I think can direct us to where more specifically it tells us where help can be provided um, or that interventions can be created. I know from our experience at Black Rainbow, we weren't active on Instagram until early um, 2020. So just just before um, the pandemic um, hit and lockdown hit, we hadn't account. But at the time, we only had about 220 followers. Um, as of this morning, we have over um, 16,400 followers. So in that first year, the, the rise of numbers by Instagram was actually quite astronomical. We have healthy numbers across Facebook and Twitter. I think Twitter's just under 9,000 and uh, Facebook is hovering around, I think, 13 or 14,000. But Instagram for us is, is quite a, there's, an, there's opportunities here. Um, in terms of interventions and support. Um, and we've been using our presence on social media more as a community notice board for sharing information, as well as, you know, po providing um, a place where people, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, queer folk can come to to see themselves and the work reflected positively. But we're fully, really, we're fully um, yet to harness the reach that we have in terms of um, the support that is needed. Um, so there's, there's plenty of opportunities ahead. I do think, Damien, that perhaps some of, I wonder just off the top of my head, if perhaps some of the increased reach on social media has both about people needing that support, but also in terms of visibility. I know people like Courtney Act has been a very strong advocate for the work of Black Rainbow. I wonder if, you know, how that has helped your outreach and uptake. Oh, absolutely. Um, our accomplices and our work that we're doing have been very, very valuable in, in increasing our reach, and not just within our community, but also to the broader community outside of ours as well, about who we were. You know, uh, the both times that Courtney's been on Dancing with the Stars, we've been at her charity of choice. So that's given us millions and I mean, the reach from that, from, from mainstream TV, um, has been quite substantial. And it's really supported us also around being able to have conversations um, because of Courtney's audience and who who was in that audience has now come over into ours and reached down and said, look, what can we do? Which has been really helpful. Uh, next slide, please. Look, and um, this here, you know, this slide in particular, in light of the levels of suicidality and, and mental health that were on one of the previous slides, these help seeking levels um, are of considerable concern. Um, the only way I can see that this will increase is through an in investment in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander LGBTQI plus SB suicide prevention, uh, mental health and social emotional being. Um, as I've said previously, there, there isn't a substantive investment in our health and well-being um, at this moment in, in time. And you know, to increase these levels, that we need to ensure there needs to be an investment. One, we need to understand what are actually the help-seeking behaviours of our community um, and what services do we need um, at the moment. There, there is there's some preliminary data that that identifies the need, which we knew anecdotally. And, and I certainly did, I created a workshop about six years ago to increase the cultural competency of, of um, suicide prevention services um, and now more broadened to social services so that they were a lot more, I guess, First Nation queer friendly um, so that to increase access for, for our community. But this, as I've said before, there's, there's, there's a considerable amount of work that still needs to be done. This report is the first national study that even has in the baseline data that even mentions around the suicide ideation or suicidal thoughts. So there's still quite a bit of work to be done. And 
you know, with, with suicide being um, such an important discussion to have, but also, you know, the I think the latest um, data that came out that Aboriginal suicides went up during the pandemic, others went down in 2020. The, um, the rates of suicide are much higher than 2019, and it's been a steady climb. Uh, next slide, please. Um, for those that were accessing mental health um, support, this data provides a foundation of where, where, where the, um, and what can be can be strengthened. Um, you know, these are still quite considerable low numbers, but they are, I guess, in, encouraging. And it's looking at those particular areas of support. Um, which are, you know, um, across telephone and video conferencing, um, the online support, and also during the, or the use of the crisis text or the or the crisis hotline, is that our mob are actually using these services. So how can we strengthen these services? And this here is going to take around you know, looking at the help seeking traits of how and why and what attracts people to this to these services, but also. What's not attracting, you know, the um, the other two thirds of our population who are who are in who are identifying that they are in distress. Um, so again, there's, there's quite a bit of work that can be done, um, but it is it is it does give us some insight into uh, of a starting point of where we can go, where we can be, we can begin. Damien, um, I mean, you mentioned on the previous slide, you know, the low numbers of people accessing services and you said what needs to change, but what are some of the barriers that are happening at the moment? Is it about there aren't queer-specific First Nations services? Is it that First Nations services aren't inclusive of queer people? What what do you think it is about that's meaning that low uptake? Look, I mean, there's a, there could be more universal, you know, um, response I can give around, you know, stigma, um, those types of things. But in terms of services, what we don't see is we don't see services uh, or enough services um, or, you know, I think there's there's a handful that are doing this, but we don't see services that from the outside looking in are presenting themselves to the First Nations, you know, rainbow community saying, come through our front door, access our service, you are welcome here. And it's something really as simple as that. These services are essential services. It's getting people through the front door. And if that front door doesn't look inviting, people aren't going to access it. Uh, next slide. Yep. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so with, um, with the one third of respondents who did access um, professional support, nearly half of them reported obstacles. Um, and for those who went looking, which wasn't captured, about a quarter of said that the service that, that they needed did not exist or was not available to them. And I think this also goes to your question you just asked, um, Damien, is that, um, however, I think that, that we need to know what the, serv what the service is that people need um, for the first instance and um, that did not exist and was not available. And is it racism at uh, mainstream services that is um, stopping our mob from accessing those services? Is it the presence of the phobias um, among Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, services that, that isn't stopping our mob from accessing those services? So if when those things exist, either um, in actual or uh, they're perceived, then we have two significant service providers in this country that our mob aren't accessing. And that's when they, that's when I think it becomes that the service that I need isn't available. Um, I I don't believe that we need to start setting up First Nations queer services around the country. I think this is about increasing the cultural competency of both First Nation organisations to the Aboriginal medical services to be better equipped in engaging with you know the LGBTI Aboriginal community, but also with mainstream services. And this includes LGBTI services as well around being better at and, and better equipped um, around increasing their position and strengthening their um, their reach um, and also their attractiveness to um, to First Nations um, Rainbow Mob. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So these here um, are just a selection of the findings um, that were applicable to today's uh, webinar. Um, for myself, four and five are of particular significance. Um, you know, 
as I said earlier, you know, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, you know, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, you know, non-binary, um, sister girl and brother boy um, folk, we are we're considerably absent from, from suicide prevention efforts, particularly at a federal level. There are some states and territories that are mobilising, but when you look at federal funding and the overarching plans, um, so the Fit Mental Health Plan, uh, the implementation of all that funding, there's nothing for our community. And it, it goes back to without data, there is no policy. Without policy, there is no funding. So it is my hope that even this preliminary data that we've uncovered here through our research, that this we can use to champion, to change policy, to affect policy, to create new policy, so that when it comes to funding, that there is money allocated for those who want to do this work or within the existing funding, that there is KPIs in there that people need to report back against to say, yes, we are actually investing in the preventing the suicide of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, LGBTQI plus people. And one of the things too that I would highly recommend if you're in these positions of leadership within suicide prevention is to include Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander LGBTQI people within the, within those leadership discussions. And, and as someone who has a first-hand lived experience of, you know, I've had depression, anxiety, I've got a first-hand lived experience of suicidality, first-hand lived experience of bereavement, we need to have people at the table that bring more than just lived experience. We need people with expertise. We need people with qualification. We need people um, that have done First Nations queer work. We just can't have uh, someone there just because they identify as First Nations or across the rainbow spectrum. Um, before any, again, it, when you receive this report, and this is kind of a, um, a, a call for help, I guess, or for assistance, is that, again, there's going to be data within this and findings within this report that I'm, I don't have the capacity to really to, to, to look at and say, okay, this is what needs to happen next. So once you've received this report and you can see opportunities for implementation for some of these findings or to assist with implementation science, please reach out to us. Um, again, there's quite a bit of research that, that needs to happen. Suicide and mental health are just one component. There is it's quite a raft of um, other areas of research that needs to be done. Something that's not in this presentation, um, but is in the report, that just over a third of respondents um, identified as having a disability, which I think has significant uh, implications for the NDIS. Um, there was at least half of the respondents did not feel safe in the spaces that they were in during during lockdown. So that that's considerable um, in terms of we need to look at why that is. Um, we know that out of research out of Western Australia that came out a couple of years ago, um, that First Nation LGBTQI folk over there didn't necessarily always feel safe within the Aboriginal spaces or in queer spaces. So there is this isolating effect that happens. Um, so please do reach out. There's um, quite a bit of work to be done and um, many hands make light work. And I think something so important that, that comes from this research is that, you know, COVID's not over. So we know that First Nations people experience compounding effects of racism, of colonisation. So that's sort of a baseline and that, you know, it relates to suicidality. And then for First Nations queer folk, we have compounding phobias, as you mentioned before. And then COVID adds to that as well. So I think we need to be mindful that this was a snapshot at a point in time, as you said, but that point of time hasn't ended. And so those elevated rates on top of the existing compounding things is likely to be continuing. Yeah, no, absolutely. And the fact that this is the the only Aboriginal study, like on, on the impact on, on the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander community, I think we're we're already ahead of we're ahead of that curve. You know, we we've started this conversation. So there is the there's the COVID elements um, that this price provides foundation for in terms of you know the ongoing pandemic and in long COVID. But then there's the um, the service provider stuff, you know, as well in terms of how to strengthening services or the need for services to to strengthen their outward facing um, their look. But also around, you know, we need to collect this information. That nearly 50 50 percent of um, respondents, again, as you said, it's a lot, it's a quite a decent sample size. Um, express uh, express suicidality during that or suicidal thoughts during that period is really quite um, quite concerning. And also that there was elevated. Um, periods of mental health distress as well. And the two aren't necessarily always 
uh, related. They can operate in, in, you know, individually. Suicide, you know, being behaviour, mental health being more of a diagnosis and experience. They're not necessarily related, but sometimes they can be, which just makes the heightens the risk already, um, particularly for First Nations queer folk, where we know that racism is a significant risk for suicide, but also the phobias that we experience as lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer, intersex, non-binary, you know, sister girl and brother boys. Thanks, Damien. So as everyone can see on the slide here, uh, questions can now be asked using the speech bubble icon. Um, we've also got some questions that have already uh, come in and we're going to start by having a look at those. Uh, so, and, and also I've asked to, to, to remind you that you can join the chat by clicking the two speaker box icon on the top right of your screen. You can also ask a question by clicking on the speaker box icon on the bottom right of your screen. So there are lots of ways to engage with us now. So a question that we got asked before the webinar, we had a whole lot of lots of questions coming before the webinar, so we can't obviously get to all of them and we won't be able to get to all of the ones that are coming in live now, but we've chosen a few that Dan would really like to respond to. So one of them is living and working in remote Aboriginal communities has been very challenging to assist Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander, LGBTIQ young adults and children. They often get bullied a lot and are scared to stand out for themselves. As a professional, how can we support them and their family to live their life in freedom? Cheers, Damien. Um, I've worked predominantly of my career, uh, well, the, the better part of the last decade in, um, in the northern half of Australia. Um, for the first half of my work in suicide prevention was working across the Kimberley um, within re <clears throat> those more remote community spaces. And what I know from when you, when you live in those towns and work in those towns that during your day, your working hours, you're in a particular role, but also outside of that, you're part of the community. So there's a couple of things that I would suggest you could do. There's visibility of um, queerness within your workplace or First Nations, um, you know, LGBTQI visibility, um, Black Rainbow, see behind me, we're going to have some um, merchandise um, and promotional stuff like these posters available later this year. Um, simple things like wearing badges. Um, I'm also rocking our wear a purple shirt, um, wear a purple day shirt that we've got available for the next two days. So these are these are the, the I guess the symbolisms for that can our mob can connect to and say, well, that place there feels like a safe space for me because it's it's presenting in a way that is welcoming. But outside of your role, you can still do the same things. And, and so that at a community space uh, and in that environment, they can see themselves reflected positively as well. And But also what I found is that when you do do this, it also promotes conversation between those who don't know much about this topic. And then that just grows the, visual, the, vis the visibility and support at a community level. Thanks, Damien. We just had a comment come in live from Mary and she very kindly said that she hadn't heard of Black Rainbow before this webinar today and she's definitely going to reach out and engage and, and in her work in inpatient units at a hospital. So it's wonderful to hear people are already learning today just by attending the webinar. So another question that we had uh, came in earlier was I'd love some advice on supporting a young brother boy who lives off country and who is not well connected with mob looking for advice on seeking permission from their community to self-identify as a brother boy, brother boy as per cultural protocols. Yeah, look, firstly, um, for those that aren't familiar with the term brother boy or sister girl, uh, these are, um, these are ex culturally or socially acceptable um, terms for some of the uh, Indigenous trans community. Um, then they're not applicable to all trans folk. Some, some, some trans folk are actually non-binary, and so they don't <coughs> identify as sister girl or brother boy or male or female. <coughs> so these are, excuse me, <coughs> these are self-selected names. And so a brother boy is an, is, um, could be an Indigenous trans male. Now, in, in, to answer your question, um, I'm not aware of any <clears throat> cultural protocol that does exist in, in communities, um, but I would in, encourage um, that person to be who they are, and but also in doing so, providing that kind of wraparound support while they're doing so. Um, you don't want to just push somebody out into the, you know, out into the space without providing that support. Um, so be very mindful that you're also going to be providing support for them. We know that um, at the point of realisation, uh, whether it's, you know, your sexuality or gender identity, that is one of the highest um, places to be in, in terms of suicide risk. Um, this just adds an extra bit of layer in, in terms of acceptance um, around that. But it, and, and when I say that, um, that I'm not aware of any 
cultural protocol, it's not to say that nothing exists. It's just that I'm not aware of it. And something that um, a few of us have been doing for quite a few years is, you know, how was even trans defined um, and expressed you know, pre-contact. So if you go back, you know, 100, not 100, sorry, you know, 10, 20, 30,000 years, how was that? The language that we are using and even the rep- the presentation of trans now would be a lot different. And so we can ask questions around, um, you know, cultural protocol for trans, but we have to make sure that the language that we're using to describe what's going on actually meets um, what the community um, already understand or interpret transness to be um, prior to. Um, and then tell them about Black Rainbow. I mean, Black Rainbow exists online. Sorry, Damien, um, particularly on Facebook and stuff, and on um, you know Instagram, obviously, so that when they they don't feel isolated and lonely, that they can see um, themselves reflected positively. And what we do know is that um, our mob are quite resourceful, so they they go through a lot of the comments and able to then um, identify people like themselves. And there's been connections with it, and it's that informal peer to peer support that we find that's happening. Thanks, Damien. So Judy's asked if the slides are going to be available. Yes, Judy, they absolutely will be available to you after this webinar. Uh, We've had another live question come in, Damien, saying what are some of the best practices or current good ideas to making the front door of a service uh, welcoming or inviting? Um, I'll tell you a bit of a story. I deliver, um, the, 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 as I said, this um, First Nations Queer Cultural Competency Workshop, and I delivered it in um, Tennant Creek. Um, I, I delivered it throughout the Northern Territory, did um, a bit of a road trip down to Alice Springs. And uh, Anya Nini is the Aboriginal Medical Service in Tennant Creek. And I delivered to a third of their staff. So it was about 30 or 40 staff at the first um, the first workshop. They invited me back a second time. So I worked with them to find some additional funding to get me back down to Tennant Creek. And when I, just before I started, um, there were people who had been to the first one who wanted to come back to the second one. And what they shared with me was that they had um, at one of their, I think it's their family and, um, and children's centre, which is on the main street, which in Tennant Creek, everything's on the main street, um, on the Stewart Highway. There were three flagpoles and only two were being used, one for the Aboriginal flag and the other for the Torres Strait Islander flag. They actually had a rainbow or pride flag in their office space. And so they put it up. Um, I also hand out badges um, throughout the workshop as well once once it's been completed. And one of their clients um, was was accessing the service as a single parent, um, getting support, um, you know, in the stresses that they were experiencing. Shortly after that flag went up, they disclosed to the person, that that their therapist or the person that they were seeing, that they were actually in a same-sex relationship. And that they then started to bring their partner into the conversation or, or into the into the service. Prior to that, they didn't know that they could feel comfortable enough to to share um, that they were actually in a same sex relationship. Um, similarly, with um, a younger client, um, their their counsel support worker had a rainbow. Um, I have the rainbow badges that I give out have also the black and brown stripe on it as well to be more inclusive. They saw that and they disclosed, and this was after a 12-month relationship, therapeutic relationship, they disclosed to their support worker or counsellor that they were, um, you know, uh, their, of their sexuality differences. And this is the, the, sim- the simplicity of, of this symbolism has it's opening up um, and in, in strengthening the relationships in the therapeutic context. And this particular young person, um, the, the work that they were doing together was able to really get to the root cause of um, what was causing them the distress. And so they the service that was able to provide it was a lot more richer. And it just can be came down to a badge and a flag. So these are really these are starting points. Um again, essential services are behind these front doors. So they must must be welcoming for all everybody to go through. Thanks, Damien. And I think in a way, uh Damien's just answered a question that came in from Amy on the live, which was about good cultural competency training. And I think, you know, Damien's just mentioned he's delivering that training, so certainly reach out to him. Uh, And if he can't get to you or, you know, a a webinar doesn't suit you, um, then he'll certainly be able to connect you in with other services who are doing that work. So we'll go to another one of our questions that we got um, ahead of the webinar today, which is I work as an EAP counsellor, mostly on the phone or Zoom. I would like your views on any specific considerations I need to apply when speaking with Indigenous queer folk. 
Um, I would um, apply the same considerations that you would use when in person. Um, I think that there is um, you also to be, and this is where the person-centred um, focus comes into play, um, don't come with any kind of assumptions around, um, oh, I've got an Aboriginal person, you know, on the phone or on the video or in person, or I need to behave in a certain way. Um, at the previous um, webinar I've done for MPHN, the the thing that I said is just don't be racist. Um, and then it's also, you know, in, in terms of, you know, if they're being LGBTQI as well, it's just don't be homophobic, don't be transphobic, and perhaps do a little bit of um, you know, research to see what that actually could look like. Um, but also, you know, the, there's there's a few myths out there um, around Aboriginal child trying folk, and and they're not. And there's, I mean, some of the, some myths are based on reality, but some of them are not applicable to all of us. You know, about not looking people in the eye. I mean, that's certainly not the case for me. Um, again, as an Aboriginal child trying a person. Um, I feel quite comfortable seeing a, a female clinician. Um, some won't. So it's about ensuring that you've had that conversation or you're aware of um, who that client is and, and really delivering a service that is centred on on who, who they are and on their needs and their level of comfortability. Thanks, Damien. So we've had a, a question come in the live asking about uh, what are good strategies for organisations to reach and support brother boys and sister girls? Well, um, again, I think it's just around visibility. Uh, it is, you know, the, the biggest barrier from the conversation that I've had with our mob is that if play, because we we live in a world where there is there is quite a bit of racism and there is quite a bit of phobia, you know, across the um, the, the sex, sexuality, and gender um, minority spectrum that the apprehension of going to services just on the thought that the experience, um, you know, is going to be negative, that they're going to experience racism or they're going to experience one of those other, um, you know, phobic aggressions, it's going to stop people from going through those front doors. So sometimes it is just as simple as, um, you know, putting a flag up. And I, I draw on that experience as a bit of a, a bit of a, um, a reader back in um, my, I was living in Perth in my twenties and, the bookstores that had the rainbow flags on it, I knew that there were stories in there about me. So that's what got me through that front door. And so don't be fearful of having us through your front door. Um, I know that there's some people saying, oh, but when they get through the front door, they could make it even worse. What's also worse is that people are not accessing the services that they need. Um, and, and the only barrier could be is that those services um, don't look um, that they are welcoming. And, and so you need to be able to, to stand outside and if you know any first nations queer folk or first nations folk or queer folk get one of them and stand outside the front door with them and say would you walk through this door and if they say no ask them why not um you draw on your local community or, and then those that are accessing your services someone on the live has asked a question which i might start responding to and then pass over to damien is what's the difference between an ally and an accomplice I think in my understanding, an accomplice is someone who's really willing to get there in the trenches and really do that work and, and uh, as opposed to an ally who might be someone who's supportive and, and may have people's back and, and an ally may not as well and an ally might just be someone who, you know, does talk the talk but doesn't necessarily walk the walk. But an accomplice is someone's really willing to sort of get in there and, and be accountable and, you know, do stuff with their privilege. But what are your thoughts on that, Damien? Uh, look, both are, I think, of, of equal value or are both valuable. Um, you know, the the more allyship that is shown for us and whether it is just waving a flag, it all helps. And this is something that I've learned over the time, you know, through Black Rainbow's presence or social media. Um, I've been asked, um, I do a, um, a, a lecture session for um, a course out of Macquarie University and I get asked about slacktivism. To me, it all actually, it all plays a role. Um, if it increases, the, particularly, I guess, for us, if it places, if it increases the visibility of First Nation queer folk, I'm all for it. The accomplices stuff, like this works hard work. It's really hard work. And, you know, I, this was not something that I, Black Rainbow was nothing that I set up to where it is now that I'd ever envisioned it would be. I had a job, I had a career trajectory um, doing other stuff. I'm a bit of a nerd. I want to create apps. Um, but, you know, the way in which it's evolved based on the feedback is, and, you know, through this experience is that the tough conversations and people say you've got to have tough conversations. 
they're brutal. And they're also brutal in terms of like, ultimately, I've got to say to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait in the health sector, you're being homophobic. You know, so you've, I've got to go back to this to community, uh, my own community, and say, you're being homophobic. And then also then to the LGBTI community and say, look, you're being racist. You know, the barriers that you're putting up, the structural racism here exists. And so it leaves you in this place of, you know, being quite um, isolated because you've just, you know, the two other arms of our service provision in this country outside of mainstream is, that, you know, the rainbow service industry and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait one. And the leadership I go to, well, there's racism and there's homophobia that you're that you're presenting. And both groups don't want to hear that. You know, they don't want to hear that they're behaving in that way. So it, it and this is where I think there's a lot of struggle in terms of the advancement of First Nations queer work is that we are talking back to our leaders and saying in both the queer community and the First Nations community, it's like your behavior is harming us. Homophobia is a risk factor for suicide. Racism is a risk factor for suicide at a structural level. And as I, at the beginning of this, when I said, this research was funded by donations. This, it was through the partnership with Macquarie University. And this is the accomplice stuff, stepping up and saying, yeah, we're gonna join you in this. We're gonna get this work done. Um, like our babies are dying too. And so it is tough work. But it's important work. So the accomplices, they're the ones that, you know, have the capacity to get into those trenches and take a few of the punches with us as well. Thanks, Damien. Um, Jackie's asked a great question, which is when it comes to visibility, some may feel that while our, our identities are becoming normalised, that our visibility may expose us to danger and violence. Is there any advice or opinions you could offer in regards to navigating this sensitive and vulnerable space? Wow. Um, I think that, you know, and I can only draw, and I guess I can't speak for I guess anybody else, but I can just draw on my own experience. We become some re really resilient folk and individuals um, in terms of, you know, simply just coming out. Um, there's a lot of celebration these days in, you know, in terms of people coming out. Um, but I also think that there's a significant proportion of um, queer folk who have been out for a long time. Um, and it's hard. It does. It, I mean, I, I'd hope that it's it's better now. Um, but it is around, you know, if you're more aware now of the, um, as I guess, as non, um, non-queer folk, of the, um, the challenges that are out there, then you can step up and provide that extra bit of support um, for those people or even at a, at a community level. Um, I can't tell you how much of a relief it was um, for marriage equality in the past. I mean, that there's a cultural shift um, for us as a, as a nation um, when marriage equality apart and um, got passed. And, and the message that we got loud and clear is that, you know, for a large portion of our population group, they've got our backs. Um, so that was really heartwarming. Um, I'm not sure if Damien has frozen. Um, Dan, can you let me know, please? Okay, I'll, while Damien sort of resets, I'll step in here uh, for a minute. Something that I would throw into this conversation about the cost of visibility is I've read a book recently, a wonderful book by Mark E. Bay called Black Trans Feminism. And it really talks about, you know, the, the quite steep rise in the public visibility of trans women of colour in particular across the world. So we think of an example like Laverne Cox in Orange is the New Black. And so that, you know, and she was on the cover of Time magazine. It was labelled the transgender tipping point. So to have a black trans woman as the figure of that tipping point is really important. But I think that um, what the book Black Trans Feminism really talks about is that, sure, that visibility is so important. It gives other black trans women uh, awareness that they're not alone. But then it comes at this great cost of, of black trans women in particular being targeted for that visibility. So absolutely we need to be mindful that when people are becoming more visible, they also become more vulnerable. And so that becomes the work of the accomplices and the allies to really step in and step up and say, hey, not just I've got you back, but I'm going to respond to that racism. I'm going to respond to that transphobia so that that visibility isn't solely a cost uh, to, and in this instance, to First Nations queer people. Thanks, Damien. I'm glad you're back again.
And you're on mute, Damien. Yeah, I'm on mute. Yes, don't know what happened, <laughs> but I'm back. Yeah. So we might go to another question that we got uh, before uh, the webinar today, um, which is what feedback have you received from more remotely located communities about service availability or barriers? And what providers or services would be beneficial to folks from the queer community in those locations? Um, more, more information, more knowledge. Um, tell us more. Um, one of the things that came out of the, the study that we did in Western Australia um, came from our elders, which is really rich. They said, tell us what we need to know. So it is around maintaining these conversations and uh, bringing these conversations in, into those communities. But it needs to also be done in a respectful way. Uh, the, again, the workshop that I deliver, I deliver to, to, um, to services. But what I know from, you know, working in regional remote um, Australia is that a lot of First Nations mob, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander mob work at these services. So by attending the workshop, not only am I sharing them information that can strengthen their service delivery, but outside of their work hours, this is information that they can go back and have conversations in their families, um, in, in their communities. And what we are seeing, and I'm not saying it's a direct result of my workshops, but really in terms of the conversations around First Nation queerness and the visibility, is we're now seeing a lot more engagement, you know, in pride by First Nation organisations or support um, from Aboriginal medical services and the like. But also during NAIDOC, we're also seeing, um, you know, First Nations queer folk being sought out to actively participate and become speakers at these events. Thanks, Damien. And just thanks to the people who we've answered their questions for posting your thanks to us. It's really great that you're engaging and that you're feeling like we're, we're getting to your questions and we're doing a good, good job in answering them. So another question we got ahead of the live was uh, the specific obstacles in receiving mental health care by the communities that we're talking about today. Uh, look, again, I think we touched on this earlier on. It's like apart from the, um, I guess, the universal barriers that exist for all the people, we have more namely stigma, um, you know, is the need for um, organisations to engage in First Nations uh, queer cultural competency training to at least understand. Um, and, and part of this here that you're doing is part of that, is that for a lot of people, um, they, they until they ex um, participate in this conversation, is they didn't even know of the... Um, the risk or the um that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, you know, LGBTQI plus were of, of considerable uh risk um across quite, quite a, a large um range of issues. So I guess for this presentation here or this webinar, you know, we, we I'm focusing more on the suicide um outcomes here or the data and also the mental health. So we need to be able to ensure that you know the the, the services to if you're particularly delivering in those areas, um again, increasing access. Um, but also it's around, you know, when you're speaking, it is that, that person-centred, that client-centred approach. It's understanding um, your client or your consumer, whatever term that you use, understanding their story and what it actually means to them also to be First Nation, uh, First Nations queer folk. Um, don't bring any stereotypes or any myths to the table. Seriously, seriously, sorry, not seriously, simply just focus on who they are as you would with others and, and not make any prejudgments. Um, and something that I say um, is be um, easy on yourself if you make a mistake, just apologise for it. Um, you know, overcoming that fear of making mistakes is going to make the relationship also a lot stronger, which is the outcomes then also for your client. Um, so, you know, when only, um, you know, I think it was about 30% um, had engaged with services, be mindful of the distrust that may already exist and allow for the relationship to develop. It may have taken some really big strides and big steps for that person to, you know, to realise, not only realise that they needed the support, but to go in the face of potential, you know, um, microaggressions or racism or, or phobia that they knew they needed support. And so they've taken that step. So be mindful that the, there could be some fragility in that initial parts of that relationship. And something we spoke about in our last webinar we did together, Damien, on LGBTIQ people and suicidality was around if we make those those slips, those mistakes, for example, if we mis misgender someone, to say thank you for being corrected and I'll do better next time. Because, of course, when we say sorry, the cultural response is to say, that's okay, but yeah. it's not okay. 
that we've misgendered someone. So we don't want to put trans people, for example, or if we say something unintentionally racist, we don't want to put Indigenous people in the position of having to say that's okay because it's not. So yeah. we sort of we say thanks. Thanks for correcting us, um, and I'm really going to do better next time. Um, um, I'm going to learn from that. Yeah. So a question that we've had come in on the live from Matty is, can you comment on ways that communities could be connected on a more grassroots level so that people don't depend only on government provided services and can build resilience within themselves. Um, you would know your networks better than I do. Build those, um, strengthen those, um, start those conversations um, with the other services that are in town. Um, there's a whole lot um, that can be done um, independent of, you know, government funded services. You know, I know this from working in regional and remote places. Um, the workshop that I'm about to, when I roll out throughout the Northern Territory, um, I think I get about 30 people at each session. There could be up to 10 different organizations at those um, at those workshops. And even in small places, I can almost guarantee that not everybody knows each other or talking to each other. But what I find has happened is that because they've all attended this workshop, it, it strengthens or creates a relationship because they've come in and they've just spent a whole day learning the same thing. And so there's a more of a collective response out in the community at a service provider level, but also after hours as well, in terms of supporting um, First Nations rainbow folk. And that in a way sort of answers a question that you might want to say more to Damien, that's just come in on the live from Jordy, which is asking what can people do to support financially or as a volunteer or in terms of services, in terms of the lives of First Nations, LGBTIQ, uh, sister girls and brother boys? Um, the first thing we do is, you know, in the environments that you're in, um, see what's what's locally happening. Um, and um, one of the things that works really well for us is that people come to us and say, um, these are my skills, do you need them? Or this is what I can do? Or um, what can we do? Um, you know, in terms of um, funding or like, yeah, Black Rainbow operates on donations, we, we are very particular about where we spend our money as well. I'm, I've been working in health for over two, two decades now. And the thing that is, was drummed into me in my very early in my studies when I was doing my social work double degree is around outcomes and impact, not just outputs. That, there has to, that what you do has to make a difference. So that's why for us, our investment in this research is that this is this is not an output for us, this is an outcome with the hope that there's going to be other outcomes here so we can create that impact. You know, the fact that we have, you know, some of the, the first baseline data around mental health and suicidality for our community, um, uh, again, is, is one to be celebrated, but also, you know, in 2022, this is where it has taken this long to get here. Um, so, you, I would, in your first instance, um, in your in your surrounding, in your, in the community or in the environment that you are, um, see what's operating there. But I know this as well in, in in the creation of Black Rainbow is that we've had to take our lives online because at that our communities, you know, don't necessarily always accept us. So we've taken our message online. So if you don't have access, you know, if your community is online or in you don't you don't not aware what's in your your local community space. By all means, support us. Um, you know, your money goes towards um, work that needs to be done. Everything that we do, um, there's a reason behind it. Um, our graphics are really amazing. Our colours are really stand out. Um, but there's a reason behind what we're doing, and and it's about also the messaging around um, that First Nations queer folk exist because a lot of folk don't know that we do, um, and also that there is uh, this this this. This initialism, these funny letters, LGBTQI, are really quite confusing for people. And, and even um, I know some non-Aboriginal heterosexual folk is like, who, who are my, uh, my mates from school? And they're like, we have no idea what this language is or what gender affirming care, care is. So we're using our position and our place um, and our visibility and our reach to, to provide that also for that education. Thanks, Damien. Well, Unfortunately, we're at the end of question time. I think a few just came in at the last minute, which always happens. Uh, but uh, I think a lot of what Damien just said now actually answers a lot of those last questions about resources and the best ways to connect with people. And clearly Damien was just talking about uh, online and obviously some of his findings suggest that Instagram is a great way to reach out to people. Uh, next slide, please. 
So thanks again to Damien for uh, everything that he spoke about this evening and being such a generous speaker and answering so many uh, questions. Um, in terms of resources uh, that have been recommended by Damien, there's lots of them available there, including contact details of Black Rainbow, which as we've spoken about many times, is a great place to start the conversations, even if that means Damien directs you somewhere else. I think it's a really important place to start. And so you can see that on the resources tab. And we'll also have this information coming out to you along with the slides uh, as a follow-up uh, to this webinar. Next slide, please. Please, 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 before you log out today, um, complete the survey reminder and you also get a prompt about that. It's really helpful for MHPN to learn what was done well and what we could do better or what you might like to learn more about in the future. Um, your statement of attendance will come out um, within the next month uh, and we'll give you, as I said, that you know a link to the online resources that, that have been compiled to, su to support the um, webinar today. Um, I'd also really like to emphasise which what we said at the beginning of today's webinar, which is that this is the first of four of part of the Queer Robbery series. Uh, the next one's going to be on November the 3rd, and we'd love you to join us for that. And the next one coming up after that will be in February next year. Damien's already lined up some amazing speakers who will talk through a real diversity of topics in this area. So I'd really encourage you to join in for that. And the next uh, MHPN webinar is coming up is one in, in partnership with Emerging Minds, which is supporting children and families to recognise and navigate paediatric anxiety on September the 7th. I got my email about that this morning, so hopefully you did too. And if you're interested, we would really encourage you uh, to, to sign up for that webinar as well. Just on, um, sorry, the, um, the next um, queer robbery um, webinar, that's um, the study out of WA that I've been referring to called Breaking the Silence, um, another groundbreaking study led by um, First Nations queer folk as well. And I think that's what's so important about this series is, you know, I'm not First Nations here and so that's, you know, a complex issue for me sitting here as the facilitator or Damien's invitation, but, you know, the, each one is being determined by Damien and who, who he invites and the content is being determined and delivered by First Nations people. So I think it's such a vital space and to, for people to be hearing about the latest research. I mean, today you're hearing about Damien's research that isn't quite out yet, in the next couple of days it will be, but really getting that cutting edge information that otherwise may be hard to come by, and but hopefully is really helpful to your service. Um, here on the screen, we've got some other uh, MHPM webinars that are coming up in the next month or two. And we've also got a podcast series. You can sign up through the MHPM portal to get more information about this. You can obviously follow the Twitter feed, uh, MHPM Twitter feed, to make sure you're hearing all the latest information and not missing out on anything. Next slide, please. So you probably know the work of the MHPM. It supports 350 networks across the country. You can go to the MHPM website and check out any information there that has endless resources. All these webinars are recorded. And so obviously you can go back and watch them. You can access the resources that support them. So it's a wonderful free service that is provided for people to connect. So before I close, I'd like to acknowledge the lived experience, people and carers who have lived with mental illness in the past, and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. Thank you to Damien again for such a wonderful uh, webinar today, and I hope everyone joins us into future episodes of Queer Robbery. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate your time. Um, I think we've got just under a minute to go. Uh, just to give a bit of a plug, if you are looking for doing something for Wear It Purple Day, uh, get on the Black Rainbow website, grab one of our shirts. Uh, let's, we have a limited number and the shop shuts at midnight on Thursday, Wednesday night, um, so we can get them to you um, in time. Thanks again and I really appreciate you uh, attending today. <laughs>